In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of Newton's laws of motion. And in particular, we're going to cover the third and final law. Newton's third law is all about the idea that forces always occur in pairs. And I give a number of examples here. I push on a wall, the wall pushes back on me. When hitting the baseball, the bat pushes on the ball, the ball pushes back on the bat. We can't avoid having forces occur in pairs. You can't push on something without it pushing back on you. So your weight is pushing down on the chair, the chair pushes up on you. What Newton realized is not only do forces occur in pairs, but that those forces are always equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So if object A exerts a force on object B, then object B exerts an oppositely directed force of equal magnitude on A. Now, if you've had physics before, you've probably heard Newton's third law said in a different way. And that is, to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This is actually how Newton specified his law. Um, but one of the things you have to remember is Newton was not only inventing physics, but he was inventing the language to describe it. So often his language is actually not as good as what we have today. By action and reaction, Newton meant forces. But really, this is the way that you want to think about Newton's second law. So if I push on the wall to the right, then the wall pushes back on me to the left. It's always object A exerts a force on object B. Object B exerts an oppositely directed force of equal magnitude on A. Notice that one force is acting on B and one force is acting on A in those pairs of forces. Go ahead and see how you can do with this conceptual question. A feather falls to the ground. If the force of gravity on the feather is the action, what force is the reaction? So what's the other force in that action-reaction pair? Go ahead and pause the video and think about this for a little bit. All right, let's take a look at the answer. The first thing that we have to do to understand this problem is we have to change a little bit of the language the way it was, was given. Uh, it's really sort of purposely written in a way where you really have to think it through clearly. So we've got this term, the force of gravity on the feather is the action. Well, we want to think about, well, what is that? Well, that is the force, the Earth exerts on the feather. That is what the force of gravity is. It's the Earth pulling on the feather. So let's draw this out. Here's the Earth. And here's my feather. So the first force that we've identified, the action force, is the force that the Earth exerts on the feather. And by the way, we're going to use this notation um, really for the remainder of the course. If I write F E F, that's the force the earth exerts on the feather. So the thing doing the exerting comes first, the thing that's being exerted on comes second. That's the action force. If you see that that's the action force, then finding the reaction force is as simple as reversing the two words in the sentence. So instead of earth exerting a force on the feather, we want the feather to exert a force on the earth. That's the action re reaction pair. Now my guess is that many of you got this one wrong because it's hard to figure this stuff out when you're first learning it. Okay, But the key thing is, once you identify the two objects, earth and feather, to find the reaction force, just switch them in the sentence. So, earth exerts a force on feather, feather exerts a force on earth. 
notice they don't act on the same object. That's the key thing about an action-reaction pair. Each force acts on a different object. Now let's take a look at some of the other forces that are present in this problem. There definitely is an, a force of air resistance on the feather. It's just not part of the action-reaction pair. So let me draw that. Air resistance is simply the force the air exerts on the feather. Again, notice the way I'm labeling that, AF for air on feather. The reaction force to that, and I'll kind of draw it off to the side just to not make it too complicated, that's the force that the feather exerts on the air. So those two red arrows are an action-reaction pair as well. Okay, So in this problem, we've identified two action-reaction pairs. Now notice, and this is the key thing when we're looking at the motion of an object, if we want to study the motion of the feather, the only thing that we care about are the forces acting on the feather. right? That's what goes into Newton's second law. If we write down F net Y equals MAY, what goes in here for the feather would just be FAF minus FEF and that would be equal to the mass of the feather times its acceleration in the y direction. Okay, So remember that, that when we say the net force, that's always the net force acting on the object. So those are the two forces that we would care about if we're trying to figure out what the feather does. Here's another conceptual question. If the forces are equal, why are the results so different? For example, a rifle fires a bullet. Why don't the rifle and the bullet move in the same way? So again, let's use our notation to write out the forces. The force that the rifle exerts on the bullet, I'll label R, uh, F, R, B, so rifle on bullet. And then of course the bullet exerts an equal and opposite force on the rifle, so that would be FBR. And we know the magnitude of those two forces are the same. So if the, both the bullet and the rifle experience the same force, why are their motions so different? Well, you probably know the answer to that. It's Newton's second law. Just because two objects experience the same net force doesn't mean they'll have the same acceleration because they have different masses. So if we look at the acceleration of the bullet, we have that uh, the net force on the bullet is just the force that the rifle exerts on the bullet divided by the mass of the bullet. The acceleration of the rifle, again, is the force that the bullet exerts on the rifle divided by the mass of the rifle. Well, here's where we now have to look at these two objects. The mass of the rifle is much, much greater, and by the way, that's how we write that mathematically, two greater signs, much, much greater than the mass of the bullet. Therefore, the acceleration of the bullet is much, much greater than the acceleration of the rifle. And you can see, if you were designing a rifle, a really bad decision would be to make it as light as the bullet, because then they would both experience the same acceleration. By the way, another example of this is the car and the mosquito that we talked about in a previous video. When that mosquito runs into your car as you're driving along, both the car and the mosquito experience the same magnitude of force, but the acceleration of the mosquito is much bigger and the acceleration of the car is essentially zero. Try this conceptual question. Action and reaction forces are equal and opposite. Do they ever cancel each other out, making a net force of zero? Okay, so this is a really important one. The answer is they don't cancel out, and the reason for that is because they're not acting on the same object. A few slides ago when I was talking about the feather falling, I showed you that the only forces we care about if we're studying the motion of the feather are the force that the earth exerts on the feather and the force the air exerts on the feather. Notice that's not an action-reaction pair because an action-reaction pair never, both forces never act on the same object. 
Let me draw out another example. So let's look at our coffee cup sitting on the table. And let's identify the forces acting on the cup. So I'm going to draw it over here as a free body diagram. So this is for the cup. We've got two forces acting. We've got the normal force, but what is the normal force? That's the force that the table exerts on the cup. Then we also have the force of gravity. But what is the force of gravity? It's the force that the Earth exerts down on the cup. So I'm going to actually change color here to illustrate this. So those are the two forces that are acting on the cup. Let's find the reaction force for each of those. Well, the reaction force to the Earth pulling down on the cup is the fact that the cup is exerting an upward force on the Earth. The reaction force to the table pushing up on the cup is the cup is pushing down on the table. Notice that neither of those forces are acting on the cup. Those are the forces the cup is exerting on other objects. Again, if we're trying to understand what's going on with a cup, these are the two forces that we care about. So action-reaction pairs never cancel out because they're not acting on the same object. This and this are action-reaction pairs. And this force and this force are action-reaction pairs. Let's take a look at an example of how we need to use Newton's third law when we're doing problems. And in the next video, we're going to start going through a number of example problems using Newton's laws. And primarily, that refers to using Newton's second law and Newton's third law. Remember that Newton's first law is really incorporated in Newton's second law. Let's go ahead and draw the free body diagram for these two blocks. In this problem, we're applying a force of 5 newtons to block number 1. So that could be your hand pushing block number 1 with a force of 5 newtons. To draw the free body diagram for the two objects, I'm going to just draw a dot for each one. Let's have this one be block number 1 and this one be block number 2. Let's go ahead and identify the easily identifiable forces. We know that each block will experience a force of gravity. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and write what that is. Remember, the force of gravity in general is the mass times the acceleration. And so in this case, that will be m1g. Notice it's really important when you have more than one object in a problem, you've got to make sure to put a subscript on to identify which mass you're talking about. So that would be one of the, the forces acting on object 1. We'd also have a normal force. And I'm going to call that Fn1 because there are going to be two normal forces in the problem. Labeling things clearly is really, really important. Let's do the same for object number two. We've got mass number two. And, uh, and so the force of gravity is M2g. We also have a normal force on block number two. It's different than the normal force on block number one. And so we'll label that Fn2. Now, let's look at what's going on with the other forces. Fa is directly acting on block 1. So Fa would look like that. But now, what other forces are acting in this problem? If you said the action-reaction forces between 1 and 2, you'd be correct. So let's think about what those look like. Block 1 is pushing on block 2. So therefore, the force that block 1 exerts on block 2, and again, notice that notation, 1 on 2, would be to the right. The force that block 2 exerts on block 1, it's pushing on block 1 to the left. And so F21 would be to the left. And what we know is that F21 and F12 are equal in magnitude. That's Newton's third law. So F 1, 2 is equal in magnitude to F 
two, one. Okay, and obviously their opposite direction. So this force here and this force here are our action-reaction pair. And again, notice they each act on a different object. In our next video, we'll start to go through some problem solving and see what we can do with this knowledge that we've gained so far.